would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that human affairs were being watched from the timeless worlds of space. No one could have dreamed we were being scrutinized as someone with a microscope studies creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Few men even considered the possibility of life on other planets. And yet, across the gulf of space, minds immeasurably superior to ours regarded this Earth with envious eyes. And slowly and surely, they drew their plans against us. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Gentlemen, we are at war. Yesterday morning, a bizarre transport landed at Horsell Common near Woking. It contained what is now believed to be an advance of an invading army. For without provocation, its occupants attacked civilian and military targets. We have with us a journalist who was an eyewitness. Hopefully, he can enlighten us as to the origin and intentions of these aggressors. At midnight on the 12th of August, a huge mass of luminous gas erupted from Mars and sped towards Earth. Across 200 million miles of void came the first of the missiles that were to bring so much calamity to Earth. Ogilvy, the astronomer, assured me we were in no danger. He was convinced there could be no living thing on that remote, forbidding planet. And that's how it was for the next ten nights. A flare spurting out from Mars. A beautiful but somehow disturbing sight. Then came the night the first missile approached Earth. It was thought to be an ordinary falling star. But next day there was a huge crater in the middle of the common. And Ogilvy came to examine what lay there. A cylinder, 30 yards across, glowing hot, and with faint sounds of movement coming from within. Suddenly the top began moving, rotating, unscrewing, and Ogilvy feared there was a man inside trying to escape. He rushed to the cylinder, but the intense heat stopped him before he could burn himself on the metal. A crowd gathered on the common hypnotized by the unscrewing of the cylinder. Suddenly, the lid fell off. A huge, rounded bulk, larger than a bear, rose up slowly. Its lipless mouth quivered and slavered, and snake-like tentacles writhed as the clumsy body heaved and pulsated. Ogilvy and a few young men crept closer to the pit. A tall funnel rose, then a ray of heat leapt from man to man, and there was a bright glare as each was instantly turned to fire. The Martians continued hammering and stirring, sleepless, indefatigable, at work upon the machines they were making. People clawed their way off the common, and I ran too. I felt I was being toyed with, that when I was on the very verge of safety, this mysterious death would leap after me and strike me down. That evening, a company of soldiers came through 
and deployed along the edge of the common to form a cordon. Quickly, one after the other, four of the fighting machines appear. Monstrous tripods, higher than the tallest steeple. Walking engines of glittering metal. The pounding of guns from the common grew louder. There was a heavy explosion. The ground heaved and gusts of smoke erupted into the air. And I realized that by a miracle I had escaped. The conflict spread across the area with very high casualties. Mercifully, our artillery managed to finally destroy the invaders. Little is known about these Martians, except that they're resolved upon conquest, and their technology is far more deadly than ours. Observations of the other incoming missiles imply that they have changed course, perhaps in light of our victory, to land in Scotland. All of our forces are being mustered to face them. Our chief scientists and engineers are already working on technologies which may aid us. We must face and destroy this Martian threat. For if we fall, the rest of the world must surely follow. Gentlemen, good luck. <laughs>